special meeting. And I don't believe we have any requests for remote attendance by board members. So, Allison, please take roll. Director Martinson? Here. Director Kintosh? Here. Director Stone? Here. Director Quillacy? Here. We do not see Director Ulrich quite yet. And then Chair Berg? Here. And then Jack Curtis called in advance and let us know of his absence. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Uh, let's see, we have a special meeting tonight, so I don't believe there's any changes or amendments to the agenda. Um, item five public concerns. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board. On any item not on the agenda, but under the subject matter jurisdiction of the Ohio Valley Sanitary District. Have any public concerns tonight? Okay, let's move on to the consent items. Items uh, all consent items are considered in single motion and voted on without discussion. Any item removed from the consent list at the request of a board member. Or the public will be considered immediately following the approval of the remaining consent items. We have items six, seven, and eight. Can I ask a general question about minutes? Without pulling the minutes from the. My question is when we go into closed session, we come out, the attorney always says we discuss these items and no action was taken, or if action was taken, it's cited. But I'm just curious if it would be. For future board meetings, it would be appropriate to announce when we've had a serious milestone in a, in a case, like if a case is either settled or resolved or whatever. In the future, would it make sense when you would come out of closed session to say, and by the way, so that we have a record that the thing was resolved or whatever? Usually, when there's a litigation matter and it's uh, finalized, it becomes a matter of public record because the final judgment in the case is entered and it's a public record. So, the necessity to make a public statement session, you could do that, but it's not required under the Brown Act. It would just be discretionary. Just my opinion is it'd be nice to have it in the future, but anyway, I'll move that we approve the consent items. Seconded. <clears throat> we do have a motion and a second for approval. Please take roll. Oh, I'm sorry. Any further discussion on these items? I just had one about what he did. Do we even notify in public anywhere that we're being litigated against? That's usually in the closed session where it's indicated that there's existing litigation and there's an existing case. That's when it's known. Okay. That's the only thing required under under Brown Act law. We don't announce that during the public in the private closed session. We litigation is ended. How it is. And saying at the end of that, no longer being sued or how it can. That's the first time the public would know about it. No, no, it's in, it's in the agenda. If there's a, if there's a litigation mentioned in the agenda, right? Right. The agenda the agenda when it says closed session, it says why we're going. Oh, okay. Session. We we have to disclose the why. That's that's what I didn't remember. Thank you. Okay, Alice, please take roll. Martinson? Yes. Director Kentosh? Yes. Director Stone? Yes. Director Quillacy? Yes. And Chair Burke? Yes. Looks like it's that time of year again for action items nine, election of officers. I believe this is Allison's moment. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> um, so we're going to take nominations um, for chairman, vice chairman, secretary, and assistant secretary. Um, chairman obviously runs the meeting. Vice chairman would step in in the absence of the chairman. Um, secretary is the official paper signer, and the assistant secretary would uh, step in in the absence of the secretary. Um, so those four offices are up for grabs. Um, you can nominate anybody who is also not here. Just so okay. you know, everybody is available to be nominated or selected. Um, and uh, so I will start with chairman. If we have any nominations for a chairman or any volunteers to be chairman. Okay. 
anybody. <laughs> it's, a, it's a resounding silence. Not hearing any, I think we're going to need some experience this year. So I would, I would nominate Bill Stone. I'm going to have it. Any other nominees? Bill, are you interested? Seems like a good idea. Sure. And now we're doing vice chairman. Do I have any volunteers or nominees? Excuse me. Is, did we have a vote on that already? We vote on all of them together or one at a time. We should vote on them one at a time. Okay. <clears throat> do we is do we need like a, a motion and a vote or is this yeah, a we, vote? We have a nomination. Was there a second to that nomination? I'll second it. The roll call would be appropriate. Okay. Director Martinson. Oh. Director Ken Tosh. Director Stone? Yes. Director Quillacy? Yes. And Chair Burke? Yes. Okay. I'd like to nominate Bill Ulrich for <laughs> He's not here. He's all right. He's doing it. He's doing it now in a bang up job because there's nothing to do as long as the chair is here. Okay. I'll second sure. that nomination. Is there any other nominations or volunteers, or shall we vote on this one? Okay. Director Martinson? Yes. Director Kintosh? Yes. Director Stone? Yes. Director Quillacy? Yes. And Chair Burke? Yes. Okay. Um, taking volunteers or nominations for secretary? I'd like to nominate Kintosh. Ooh. I mean, sign all those contracts and stuff. You've been testing, testing sure. stuff. Lots of thumbprints. A second for that nomination. I'll second that. And hearing no other nominations or volunteers, Director Martinson. Hey. Director Kentosh. Definitely, yes. Director Stone. Yes. Director Felicity. Yes. And Chair Burke. Yes. Okay, and then our final position is Assistant Secretary. Any nominations or volunteers? I volunteer since I'm doing it now. It was extremely stressful. <laughs> Always wondering if Ken Tosh is going to show up. Remember, with secretary. Mind I, I, I was secretary. <laughs> We're secretary. Yeah. Allison lets you know that you're. You folks have done something. <laughs> so we have uh, Director Martinson has motioned to nominate himself um, for his second. secretary, who is a second of policy. And hearing no other nominations or volunteers, um, Director Martinson? Yeah. <laughs> Director Kentosh? Yes. Director Stone? Yes. Director Quillacy? Yes. And Chair Berg? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now I will turn my direction to the newly elected chairman, Dr. Stone. Do you want to uh, select committees now, or would you like people to reach out to you and see well, what they're interested? I think we'll wait, and everybody can reach out if they have a preference, and we'll set that up January sometime. Perfect. We'll put that on the January agenda. And so, just reach out to directors. I mean, Chairman Stone, with your preferred committee. Um, I'll send out a reminder also. Um, to do that, and then he will announce committees in January. You just inherited the gift. Perfect. Oh, it transfers tonight. That's yes. right. no. uh, it's immediate effect. All right. We'll uh, move on to item 10 a representation letter to Fletcher and Company certified public accountant. So um, we've um, completed our audit for the last um, year, uh, fiscal year. And, um, on the TV screen there, we have Scott uh, with Factor and Company, and I'll turn it over to you, Scott. Thank you. Um, excuse me. So the uh, rep letter, that's the letter that we send for management and the board to confirm everything that you've represented to us throughout the audit. Um, there was one um, change that we needed to make down in item 24, I think, where um, it has a year on it. That's item 
37. 37? Okay. Uh, we should, instead of saying 2020, we should uh, leave that as uh, either current year. And what we're doing there is just allowing uh, flexibility in case you folks decide that you want to change to the uh, another method for reporting your fixed assets. I don't think that that's going to happen, but at the same time, we just wanted to give you the flexibility. So rather than saying 2020, just say for the current year and it'll just carry forward. Well, the item that we're talking about now is is just our letter to them, right? They're Correct. Gonna... Correct. This is item ten. Our letter to them. You guys comfortable signing that? Because it requires yes. you to do a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, we're, we're comfortable with what we've represented. Mostly stuff that's already done, I think. Representation yeah. already made. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, it's an it's the normal letter. Um, there's very little that was actually tailored, um, but it is consistent from year to year, and it is a normal process throughout the audit. It's it, there's one thing that we cannot issue if we don't have that letter. Are you going to send us a revised letter, Scott? Um, I'll revise it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because this one's on your letterhead, not <laughs> mine. So I guess we need a motion. So moved. Okay. Okay. Well, now uh, I'll just run through the presentation. Wait, hold right on one second. One second. Oh. I just have to do a roll call vote. Oh, uh, sorry. It's okay. Director Martinson. Yes. Director Kentosh. Yes. Director Stone. Yes. Director Quillacy. Yes. Uh, I guess not Chair Bird anymore. Director Bird. Uh, yes. Okay, now we'll move on to item 11. Okay. 2022-23 annual independent financial audit. If this is your minute, Scott. Now I'm up. Thank you. Um, thanks for allowing us the opportunity. We really enjoy uh, being able to come say hi to you folks and, you know, yeah. listen to uh, a board meeting at times. It uh, gives us a, a better perspective on how you think and what you think. So some uh, basic things that we need to cover is uh, what's an audit. It's a uh, financial statement audit is just us looking at the information that's provided by you folks to make sure that it presents a materially true and fair view of the organization's financial performance and financial position at any point in time, or in this case, uh, June 30th, 2023. Um, it's important to remember that uh, auditors are watchdogs, not bloodhounds. Um, our responsibility is to form an opinion based on what we've seen to make sure that the report is materially correct in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Um, hiring us as auditors doesn't relieve the board and management of their responsibility for making sure that the uh, <laughs> financial statements are uh, fair and accurate. And it's important to remember that an audit only provides reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. Um, I had a board member at another district ask me how much it would cost for absolute assurance. And I told him 2.5 million dollars. We'd be happy to give that. Needless to say, he didn't want to do that after that. Um, Ohio's responsibility. Um, you're responsible for the fair and accurate presentation. Um, what Shailene and Allison do to get there was great help this year, as it always is. Um, and you folks asking questions and making sure that the financial statements are accurate on a monthly basis is a big help also. Um, you folks select the uh, accounting policies. They're outlined in note one. Obviously, some of these are more or less forced on you. GASB 68 being a prime example, GASB 75, pension and OPEB. You know, you didn't sit down and say, okay, so how are we going to measure our pension liabilities or our OPEB liabilities? That was just the way that the GASB gave it to you. And by default, you've accepted it. Um, the two biggest estimates in your books, pension OPEB and depreciation. 
Um, everything else, well, granted, there's a lot of estimates and receivables and uh, vacation and other things. Those are probably the two largest ones that we have to worry about. And then it's important that you folks remember that you're responsible for making sure that the system of internal controls functions and um, is monitored on a regular basis. Some other communications, difficulties, corrected misstatements, disagreements with management, consultations with other accountants, findings, issues, and other matters. We had no issues with any of that. Um, and one last time, management and board have full responsibility for these financial statements, presentation and accuracy, which is one of the things that you're saying in the uh, rep letter that we just talked about. Quick overview of the financial statements, uh, the opinion, a uh, clean opinion. Um, in the past, we've audited under um, just generally accepted auditing standards. This year, in anticipation of uh, the FEMA grant reporting, uh, we in increased that a bit to report under government standards, which meant we needed to do a little bit more work on internal controls and uh, some additional questions there. Um, statement of net position highlights, uh, 23 cash. You can see that we're sitting at about uh, 18 million. To compared to 22, and you can see the big change is there in the unrestricted investments. Um, overall cash decreased about uh, 6.8 million. It was 23 or almost 24 percent of assets last or this year, and it's down from 34 uh, 35 percent last year. Scott, sorry to interrupt yes. you. Did, were you yeah. gonna? Were you supposed to be sharing your screen because we can't see anything? Uh oh, yeah. I thought I was. I'm sorry. Is that better? Yep, perfect. Uh, sorry. Um, you missed all the really good pictures. <laughs> we'll start over. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. yeah. Um, other asset categories. Here's where you folks uh, really made some big changes this year. Uh, capital assets 36, that's all the in service assets. Uh, construction of progress was up to 13.4 million. Uh, OPEB asset and receivables are about another 5 million. And then deferred outflows, which is, well, not exactly equivalent, it's kind of the pre equivalent of prepaid assets. Uh, net capital assets last year. The in-service assets decreased primarily the result of a depreciation expense. Where we really had the increase was here in the construction of progress, 2.4 to 13. And um, the other assets you know, really stayed fairly consistent from year to year. Uh, the, the process is both FEMA and TDF, TMDF. Uh, Give me a minute and uh, we'll be right there. Uh, I have a slide that's specifically on the construction of progress and fixed assets. Um, important thing here is the construction of progress, that increase is really reflected in that decrease in cash. So anticipating that question, um, here's the balance of fixed assets from la or, uh, construction of progress last year. Here's this year. The big items, the nutrient TMDL, 7.3 million. So there's a big chunk. And then the FEMA were where you really spent the majority of your money in construction progress this year. One planned, two not so much. And these FEMA uh, will be the ones that next year when we do a single audit, uh, we'll be completing our testing on that. Um, some other fixed assets that you got, um, collection system, you spent 73,000, uh, bought some computers for technology equi equipment for 70 and, uh, some cl completed items on the treatment plan for 546. And then we transferred, uh, about 240,000 to, or 260,000 rather to, from construction of progress to completed, which was the, uh, Creek road manholes and the drying, uh, bed at the treatment plant. 
So did that answer your questions on the um, fixed assets? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, statement and net position, some liabilities. Uh, total liabilities about 12 million this year compared to 8.3 last year. Um, the big swing is in the pension. And some of the other current liabilities are accounts payable, which the accounts payable was primarily related to uh, surprise, surprise, the fixed assets additions. Uh, there was quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of payables that we added uh, when we did the uh, FEMA projects. Um, operating revenues. Um, you know, really nothing exciting here. Pretty consistent. Uh, we had a little bit better year with the connection fees. Um, operating expenses, other operating revenues. Uh, we had quite a swing in the investment <coughs> income, which, yay, that was a good thing. Uh, interest, interest expense, um, you know, as expected. Uh, the interest expense, remember, includes the amount we're paying and then the uh, amortization of the deferred uh, gain from uh, sale on those. So we'll pay more interest than we'll actually expense because of that uh, offsetting of the gain. Um, at the very end, we added the report on internal control, which is a new report. You haven't seen that before. And this is getting ready for that single audit next year. Um, we found no compliance issues. Um, you know, granted the compliance issues we were testing this year are not going to be as onerous as they are next year when we're looking at the grant and uh, the receipt of that money uh, that you get for those projects. Um, there, we'll be sending down to staff in the next uh, few weeks a, a packet of information that they'll need to get ready for us. Uh, so that we can be ready to do that audit uh, when time comes. Um, there's a comment in there that uh, about significant deficiencies, and I always hate how they leave that because they don't tell whether there's any found. I uh, just wanted to assure that we didn't have any significant deficiencies either. Um, big item for next year is single audit, assuming that you get the grant, which I don't see right, you're not going to. Um, and then that'll complete all the accounting for the uh, FEMA grant. Um, and with that, uh, I'll take any questions and thank you for having me. Thanks, Scott. Anybody any questions? <coughs> if you look this way, you see my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for, Scott, I'm always looking for the word clean audit or something to that effect. I gave it to you. He did say clean audit this time. Uh -huh. well, did I miss that? Darn it. Here. And, uh, my next question is uh, last month, yep, you kind of find us that there were a couple of little good ones that we're going to be hearing about. Scott, so so in our conversations and so forth, I pre advised the board and just wanted maybe your comment on it was a few items where um, we had uh, coded something in. Uh, one year and just needed to make sure it was actual expensed in the previous year, making sure that we had you know, just enough control on bill came in and when it got paid and when the work was actually completed. You want to comment on that at all? I'm not sure. I under are, are we you're referring to the expenses related to the FEMA grant? No. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um. With construction and attorneys, these are the two that are the worst. The bills come in very slowly and very late, but they're always big. So what ends up happening, because we work to get closed and get you folks done as soon as we could, there was a lot of bills that were still hanging out that uh, came in and we needed to record, which is why we ended up with some pretty large adjustments um, in uh, when you looked at the rep letter, you saw we recorded about, I want to say $8 million of uh, additional items. And 
those are items that would have been recorded one way or another. It's just a matter of timing that we didn't have it or staff didn't have it before we got there. So we ended up having to do it when we got there. Well, I've seen the word clean. I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, I'll just give you the one slide. <laughs> That'll do for me. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Um, the, the audit simply says that the representations were found, the representations from staff and management were found to be accurate, not why they were what they were. Those are questions for staff and management, correct? Correct. I have a couple of those later. <laughs> So one thing I noticed the pensions have increased dramatically year to year. What, what is that? That's that nasty pension calculation. And you know, I hate to say it this way, but it is what it is. Um the the way that the um CalPERS allocates the pension, um there's you know if they have a hiccup in investment return or in losses someplace, or if the proportion of what you folks have compared to the other agencies changes, that all shifts and changes that expense. Next year, it can be a, a go exactly the opposite way. I, I have yet to figure out how to predict what will happen with that, with that number. I, I think. Did readjust. So the actuarial numbers are showing that kind of flipped back the other direction, but it extended yeah. the mark. So the numbers will look better. The adjustment will fix part of it, but it won't make it, it won't true it up. We'll yeah. see a bit of a loss from 22. We're behind by a year. It did yeah. just recently announce. Director Bird. Actually, you want for the record? Did you Jeanette, put your name on the record? Oh, Shailene Heyman, contract control. I would like to move for approval of 11 B and C, which is accept the audit report. Well, this is a motion. Make a motion. Yeah. And item C, direct uh, distribution of copies. Give me a second. Further discussion. So we're ready for the question. <laughs> Director Martinson. Yes. Director Ken Tosh. Yes. Quillacy. Yes. Director Byrne. Yes. And Chair Stone. Yes. Thanks again, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. And uh, Allison, I'll be in touch with you tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, folks. Good night. Thank you. Item 12, replacement of information technology equipment. Gosh, these computers just keep. So, a um, couple of things. We have a, um, a matrix of all of our equipment, uh, all of our electronic equipment, and we have a life expectancy of that uh, schedule replacement. Um, one of the things we've found in, in, in sort of um, the scheduled replacements is it, it's not that the system fails. Um, it's that we don't want to even get it close to failing because it's controlling something that's of utmost importance. And the other thing we find uh, in how some of these scheduled replacements were developed, the timelines was this was driven by software upgrades. And so you start out on, on day one, you buy a new computer, you have current software. And then over time, the, the hardware stays the same, but the software they send you, uh, you know, updates and, and we found that, you know, as you get long into some of these replacement schedules, by the time you have all of the scheduled updates from all the different pieces of software that were running on the same machine. That sometimes we get in a situation where 1 of the software updates from 1 company steps on another software update from another company and we start to see. So, sort of anomalies and sort of stuff that's hard to figure out why something's off. And so. Um, I think the scheduled replacement schedule um, tries to take into account how long is this, the, the equipment going to last, the chips and the, the pieces of hardware. 
and the software before it steps on each other. If it was just your home computer, it's one thing, but when we have SCADA and we have our, our system being electronically controlled, we have to be very, very cognizant of, of the software programs stepping on each other. Um, we have this minor problem with, with, with WebEx and Zoom and uh, they both both software packages like to grab the, the audio channels uh, that they use to for their sound and their microphones in in the system we have. Well, when you go back and forth between Zoom and WebEx and they're both trying to grab the same channels uh, in the hardware, sometimes that's why we have some of the problems that we've had where we got to kind of back up, reboot the system, start over, and clean clean out that that software. I mean the channel. The same happens in our SCADA system, but it becomes very critical when you have literally thousands of inputs and outputs in the SCADA system. Uh, you don't want one pump or one motor stepping on or grabbing some other piece of data or control. So the, the schedule is is sort of trying to figure out how long something lasts and how long before something steps on something in, internal to the system. So this year we have uh, one server, and this is different than a, a sort of a, a large desktop server. This is actually a server that goes in our racks um, down at the uh, treatment plant and up here. The treatment plant domain controller is up for replacement, and that's kind of the brains behind a lot of the system. The second part is there's uh, 16 desktop computers that are also in the same replacement. So we have this replacement schedule and then we put together a budget at the beginning of the year um, that, that is adopted for our hardware and software. And then we go through the year and when it comes up for purchase, we've gone out to bid um, for the products. So this is actually um, one server, and 16 desktops and a $52,000 purchase price against a budget of 60,000. So we're a little under budget, but um, it's kind of the next wave of, of hardware that really needs to get replaced. As much as anything, as the software expands, eventually the hardware will choke on all of it. And, and warranties run out. Mr. Bird? Uh, yeah, it, this is kind of a, what happens when, when there's an upgrade uh, Windows, for instance, from 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. you, do you have to deal with that because some of the computers are not being replaced. And is that right in the admin? And Correct. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when there's some of the computers uh, being supplied to you with Windows 11 on it when everyone else has 10? Is there a problem? No, there's, there's generally not a problem with that, but there are certain pieces of software that may not run on 11. So I will get those shipped with Windows 10 on them instead of 11. Like all the SCADA computers that are being replaced, they don't support Windows 11, and, yeah. and therefore uh, they come with Windows 10 on them. So that's not doesn't surprise you when things no. start to boot it up and it doesn't work. No. <laughs> all right. I will entertain a motion. We'll move <laughs> approval of item 12. In a second, as soon as I call a roll, please. Director Martinson? Yes. Director Kentosh? Yes. Director Quillacy? Yes. Director Berg? Yes. Chair Stone? Yes. 13. <coughs> vehicle replacement 2007 Ford F550 and 2012 F250. 2023 Dodge Ram 3500. Purchase and installation of external light bar, back rack, gray and bed liner. Budget assessment. So this started in 2021 uh, during the midst of COVID. We had um, our uh, I-50 was up for replacement, and um, but it had uh, sort of a custom bed on it, had toolboxes, air compressor, welder, um, and crane on it. It's sort of our old utility uh, vehicle, and we went out to uh, purchase um, chassis. And we had a separate price to put on the bed, and we had a separate price to put on the the for old stuff stuff over. And um, it's in the middle of COVID, and um, the whole auto industry crashed uh, in terms of what they were building. They weren't building uh, 
uh, sort of one-off chassis. They were building the products that they could sell and make the most profit on. And so the 2021 replacement of the chassis and adding on the equipment fell through a couple of times. And then we started looking overall at our at our vehicles and um, our on-call truck, which whoever's the on-call operator for the collection system um, takes on a rotating basis. That trucks come up for replacement, and then we started looking at all of them and saying, you know, maybe we don't maybe we don't need two trucks. So we've uh, kind of thought through how we use our trucks and what's on each truck, and come to the sort of recommendation that we'll get rid of two trucks that are you know hit their life and uh, replace it with a one truck. Uh, we think it's a cost effective way to deal with what um, we need to deal with and be able to provide the the equipment we need to do the job, but we don't need two trucks, so we'll just do a two for one swap. The two that we're um, placing are diesel. The, the new one is gas. Um, the diesel regulations and the trucking regulations are getting um, pretty strict and pretty onerous. Um, and so we're slowly walking away from uh, diesel vehicles as they need replacement other than the big chassis. Um, just on a side note, you know, there's a lot of talk about electrification. So the, the big chassis for our water truck and our gap vacs and our uh, crane truck, they don't make chassis that are a, a zero emission vehicles. Uh, there's a rule in, in the state of California that starting January 1st to 24, all uh, medium light duty trucks need to be um, no more diesel. Um, and, the, and the chassis have to start going towards zero emission vehicles. Well, the, the zero emission chassis don't even exist yet. So it will be a coming problem as we look to replace those in a few years, not two or three, but it'll be an issue as to what we replace them with and what the regulations are at that time. But for this purpose, it's two diesel trucks going away, one gas truck being replaced um, and still being allowed to do what we need to do. Thank you. Um, I saw truck, saw some additional things coming from the dealer add-ons. How how is the transfer of all this other bed equipment that's on the 550 take place? Who does it? What does it cost? So we're not going to replace the welder. <clears throat> uh, we have a mobile welding machine. We very rarely weld. We don't do any structural welding ourselves. Most of the welding we do is quite frankly, occasionally, we weld a manhole lid shut. If we find somebody has been popping it open and doing a midnight dump. <laughs> and so uh, we still have the ability with a, a small mobile unit to put it in the pickup truck, take it down to where we need it. So we don't need a permanent welder mounted on the truck. Second part is uh, the air compressor. Uh, we used to use uh, the air compressor because we had all air tools for when we went out to a job and we needed to undo some bolts. We needed to disassemble a flange or a pump or a, uh, and so we've gone to all of the, the handheld electric models. They're just as strong torque wise and um, they're very versatile in the field because you don't have to have an air hose that you have to drag all the way to where you need it. Uh, it's all battery powered. Um, so we've gotten rid of the need for the air compressor on a grand scale. We still um, occasionally use an air compressor to pump up a plug when we're doing, a, a, you know, blocking a line. But we have a small handheld air compressor, like one of those little pancake air compressors that you see the, the framers using and so forth. Um, and that provides all we need to uh, manage, you know, the plugs. So we've gotten rid of the need for a heavy welder. We've gotten rid of the need for a heavy air compressor. Um, we replaced the crane. It had a small crane on it, which is nice. Uh, we now have a truck with a much larger crane and a, and a different bed that was replaced from years ago down at the plant. <laughs> so we don't really need the crane anymore. And so we kind of looked at it and said, hey, we can do the same job with some of these sorts of other replacement tools and, and mechanisms and, and not shortchange the guy's ability to do the work. The, the other stuff we're adding on in terms of the back rack, that's to mount the lights. Uh, it's, it's sort of a sort of a metal rack that goes in the bed, puts the lights up for the for the um, flashing lights in the bed liner just to protect the bed because they're, you know, putting shovels and tools and parts and stuff in the back. 
So, and then there's also a radio. We'll have the county. We have a great relationship with the county. They actually have a full shop out there in Somas. I'm sorry, out there in uh, Satakoy. And we have a contract, a contract agreement with them where they use their mechanics to do the work we need. And so we don't have to have mechanics on staff. We just ship the truck out there. Um, we've been doing it for years. They do a great job. They even come out here. They were out here uh, late last week at Thursday, Thursday I think. Um, they do the required DOT inspections on our big vehicle, the air brakes, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, they, they have a mobile truck that comes out to do those inspections. And so um, we would just use the county uh, mechanic shop as the shop to put on the radio, put on the back rack, put on the lights, that sort of thing. We're not going to overload this, are we? Yeah. Big wheels and all that. No. <laughs> the 77,000 is net of the trade in? No, that 77,000 is the price. Won't give us uh, an actual dollar amount value on the trade until they see it. And so there's this, this, this process of. Here's the truck. Here's the price. They bring it out to us. And we go over what the trade ins are. We modify the amount. Um, it's quite a, it's quite an accounting process to get it all done and write the check and hand over the keys and do all that, you know, but. Done it a couple of times. So 15,000 and 6,000 are best case. What do you say? You know, we're going to be something less than the 77, maybe, maybe you know, four to six thousand dollars or something. The other, the other thing about doing the trade ins, and, and it's a subtle little thing, but I think it matters. Um, in, in liability, when you sell a vehicle, um, there's this world where you're liable for the vehicle you sold. And, and even if it's, you know, the, the whole as is and it's on your responsibility to inspect it and all that stuff. People come after public agencies uh, and say, well, you sold me something and you should have known that there was a problem with the brakes or the windshield wipers or something. When you go through a dealer, it solves for us as a public agency that liability. Uh, gap. I would like to sell the vehicle and get the top dollar for the used vehicle, but we open ourselves up to somebody coming back later and saying, Oh, I had a problem. Uh, the brakes went out and I hit somebody. Uh, you, the district, have to be involved. Should have known. Should have known. And so, although we give up some of the potential upside on the sale as an independent sale, gain something, I think, on the liability, you know, sort of arm's length deal on, on the relationship. But it's, it's worth knowing that's how we make our decision on trying to sell it and get a couple of thousand more versus going through the dealer and, and solving that liability protection issue. And all that surplus noticing is being very, very expensive too. So. And the exact same decision on a personal vehicle. Well, I understand what you're saying. Jeff, um, what's the anticipated life of the, I think the new truck, I think we put them down as seven years, um, but we're gonna push them. You know, one of the things we try and do is Try and run them to almost to fail. We're not going to, you know, drive them all the way to the ground where it becomes a problem, but we're not going to just come in at seven years and say, oops, seven years is up. If we can get some more life out of it, we will. Um, we did on the 550, and I think it's worthwhile to sort of watch the level of maintenance we're needing. With trucks, as hard as we drive them, we start to see stuff. We start to see a occasional. Uh, Oil leak, or uh, we had a turbo go out on one of the one of these vehicles on the motor. You start to see some of those things come. If we can get some extra life past the seven years, but then we start to see some of that, then we're going to make maybe a decision to, you know, make a trade at eight or ten or twelve whenever whenever we see that sort of fall off happen. So with this new truck, uh, no no diesel, no turbo, looks like it's going to be easier to maintain. I, I think so. Um, I, I, I think it's a good decision to go away from the diesel and um, they, our, our trucks idle a lot and that, and that just causes problems long term in loading up the turbos and the, the diesel you know, ignition systems. Anything else from anybody? So entertain motion. Move a little 
In the second mountain, Dr. Martinson, Dr. Kentosh, yes. Dr. Berg, yes. Dr. Quellesi, yes. Dr. Stone, yes. The return activated sludge pump and motor replacement budget to just under 2024 to 15. So when we talk about sludge, it's, uh, it's the not sludge, it's the, it's the good bacteria that have made it through the system, uh, done their work in the sedation ditches, gone into the clarifier, settled to the bottom of the clarifier. So when that when those um, that sludge, those biosolids settle to the bottom of the clarifiers, we deal with them in one of two ways. We turn them into RAS, return activated sludge, which is we pump off the bottom and we re-inject them into the incoming flow on its way to the oxidation ditches. So it's a return of the bugs doing another round of good work in the ditches. The waste act, the, the, the WAS, waste activated sludge, that's what we sort of take out of the system every day. We send that flow to the belt press take those bugs out of the system, turn them into compost. And so we have this, this set of WAS pumps and RAS pumps. This is the three RAS pumps. And so uh, these were put in in the 1996 upgrade. They've gone through some, they're run pretty hard because they're running, you know, it's not just clean water they're pumping every day. They're pumping the solids. You know, the solids aren't solid like rocks or sand or grit, but solids do take, they do take a, uh, beating and rather than replace all three at once um, we thought it would be sort of to replace them one at a time over a three-year process so they're all the same going forward we get all the same manufacturer we put them in at all roughly the same point in time but we don't take all three pumps out of, out of service and put all three in both from a cost and a sort of an overall just an operational perspective so this is the first of the three um, through and do the replacement on uh, this year and then follow on two more years. I just want to make a comment that I'm really impressed with these pumps lasted 27 years. Do they make them that good anymore? Well, they go through some upgrades. We go, you know, we do some maintenance on them. We got to go in and you know, look at the impellers and look at the seals and look at all that stuff and occasionally make upgrades. But Really, in in the world of, of our business, um, stuff isn't lasting longer than twenty years anymore. To get something to go twenty years is a long time in a mechanical sort of system, and and so when we can get past ten or fifteen years and get close to the twenty years, or in this case, you know, twenty seven with a couple of you know upgrades, so that's a huge win. The other problem with having the pump world now is they're not. When they decide they're over it with that model, they just they just stop giving you support. So you try and go buy seals or bolts or new impellers or bearings or anything, and and they just don't have them. So you kind of got to do the replacement before you fall off a cliff from the you need it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Bird. Yeah, I'd like to move for approval of item 14 A and B. Second that. And second, any further discussion? One, one question, one clarification. Is thirty six thousand nine fifty for one pump? Correct. So there'll be that more time. Correct. That's including the installation. Is that no, that is not including well, well, that. Well, that'll be that. that'll be a separate ask and a separate expenditure. Right. All that. Uh, District staff can actually do the installation. It'd be pretty straightforward. We'll need a little bit of help with maybe some some pump to motor alignments, things like that. But it should be pretty straightforward. This one's this one's basically plug and play. Suction and discharge might be fast enough. Okay. Okay. We need to. Director Martinson. Yeah. Director Kentosh. Yes. Director Berg. Yes. Director Quillacy. Yes. And Chair Stone. Yes. On to item 15, 1888 East Ohio, 17 East Ohio annexation, 311. Seacrook Committee did review this, was in favor of it. So, when, anytime we um, do an annexation, 
to our district, it's basically changing the city limit line of the district. In sort of simple terms, uh, there's a map in the front that has every parcel and either white or yellow. White is um, not in the district, yellow is. And so uh, an annexation is really just changing legally the parcel from white to yellow so that we can serve them. Um, as part of that, adding it to our district uh, under CEQA, we have to make a CEQA finding that is environmentally a, a acceptable project. Um, when you do an annexation of one parcel and you are only got one house on it and you're going from one house on septic to one house on sewer, you're exempt from having to do an environmental report, but you still have to make a finding that you looked at it and you made considered uh, whether or not you okay environmentally to annex it. So it's a, um, it's exempt from CEQA from the perspective of having to do a formal environmental report, not exempt from actually acknowledging that we looked at CEQA. So these are two parcels, they're out there uh, right in that row of houses between Siete Robles and the uh, Ojai Valley Lumber, the lumber yard, and they front on uh, Ojai Avenue um, and so they want to connect to sewer. Uh, the process, this is just the, uh, the annexation process with LAFCO. There's a whole separate process they will go through to do the permitting with us, do the construction with us. Those will be follow along steps once this annexation is completed through LAFCO. Usually takes anywhere from uh, to get to this point in the process uh, from the time the applicant came in takes about Two months or so to get the application and the map done and all the paperwork ready to go. It probably will take another four months ish or so, maybe. Um, hopefully, we can go that quickly to get through LAFCO and get the map to change the parcel from white to yellow on the map. It'll take another you know, two to four months to get through that process. Then they'll come back to us and say, We want to go um, get it permitted. Uh, when they bring in their connection fees, you may see these properties in the future coming in if they want to do a deferred agreement at the time they pull their permits. But that'll be four to six months down the road. They go forward. No problem. You can entertain a motion in a second. Move approval of item 15, A, B, and C. Second. And a second, Allison. Director Martinson. Yes. Director Kintosh. Yes. Director Berg. Yes. Director Closey. Yes. Stone. Yes. Sixteen. Highway one fifty manhole adjustments contract number twenty twenty three dash thirty one. Sam Hill and Sons budget adjustment number twenty four dash twelve. So this is this is really just um, uh, sort of chasing the Caltrans project where they're going to pay from. Uh, Montessori over there on the 150 west of the, the river, all the way out to Gorham uh, on the east end of town, all the way through town. There's a competing project with um, Casitas doing their water line, and and originally Casitas was going to have to repave the whole road, and somehow the the Caltrans and Casitas have come to some understanding of what they're actually going to do. Um, the reality is, is when the Caltrans paves that. A whole bunch of manholes that need to be raised up to grade. We went out to bid to actually do that raising. It's on us. It's not on Caltrans. Uh, years ago, years ago, uh, somebody paved a street. They actually raised the manholes. Um, stopped maybe 15 years ago. Agencies said, "Hey, why should we be paying to raise manholes when we need somebody else to pay for it? Save ourselves some operational money." I understand that perspective. But it's now on us. They just paved the street, and we have to raise our our manholes to grade and whatever sort of nuance. Uh, you know, nothing's a perfect vertical. It's got the cross slope and elevations of the street. So we got to go in after the fact to do that. So we've gone out to bid um, with the project to say go fix um, these manholes, and um, we got four bids. The low bid um, was deemed non-responsive for a couple of reasons. And so we're recommending to go with the second low bidder who doesn't have the same uh, anomalies in their bid that uh, the low bidder did. Uh, we 
we seem to have gone through a spat of these local lately. A um, couple of bidders making the same sorts of questions and on the bid, um, but the rules are the rules, and so we, we review them and make sure that it's a level playing field for everybody, and everybody follows the same sort of bid rules. So, on a lot of these, we've had opportunity to have the same person doing the paving to raise the man is arranging the covers. Is that not the case here? Is the state doing this paving? Or is somebody too busy to do it? Or Well, in this case, it went out to public bid, and Rasmussen's doing the paving for Caltrans, but Rasmussen did not bid this. Um, when, when Rasmussen did the city of Ojai's paving job, they um, the city included the, the manholes in the city paving job, but said, We'll do it under our contract, but OBSD, you pay the price. So the city paving job, Rasmussen paved, Rasmussen raised the manholes. We paid the city for their costs related to those manholes. Um, last year's County of Ventura job where they paved, um, the county paved it. We raised the manholes, but the low bidder on the manholes was the paver. And so um, what we try and do, if we can get sequenced right, is we try and have our project go out to bid for raising manholes um, shortly after the paving job goes out to bid. So the paving contractors are like, hey, if I get a little bid, I'm gonna I'm gonna really give them a good price for OVSD's work, and then it all gets included. And so we try and to sequence ourselves right so that we can you know take advantage of that. Um, not only is it easy from a contracting perspective, but it's really easy when it's the traffic control perspective. Because if they're doing the traffic control for the paving, they've already got the traffic control set up. They can just kind of slide in there and do paving too. So we try and be right in sequence. In this case, Ras Rasmussen didn't bid the, the raising. <clears throat> um, I think they you know, the raising of the manholes is kind of like a, a an art form. The, if you make money, you know how to do it quick. And because um, although there are or two thousand dollars a manhole. You, you got to be really quick to get enough production each day to make the money. And so some firms do it, and some firms just don't want to touch it. Um, Let's see. Dr. Closey, um, it seems to me we've seen several paving jobs over the last two or three years, <clears throat> and in every one of them. We have to raise or pay someone to raise manholes. Is this because people have given up grinding and paving, just doing paving, so they're raising the level of the street? Um, uh, every every paving job is different. Um, uh, every street is different, um, and so um, uh, some streets. They grind out the asphalt and they put it back in same same location. Other places they grind on the edges for a new cap over the top that, that sort of tucks into the grind on the edges. Well, that one inch overlay, you know, is enough that, that our manhole's down an inch. And so you got to raise it to grade. The same goes for water cans, water valves, and, and other things that are out there. So this the same thing is going on. With the water districts that are going down Ohio Avenue with, you know, those companies. Going and getting somebody to do it as well. Um, and, and every and every uh, contractor does it differently. Um, some some come in, lower the manholes, just pave right on through and raise them some. Pave and sort of pave around them and then. And so I've, I've never been able to find in my 35 year career sort of the smartest way to do it. Um, and, and everybody that raises manholes kind of has their own little system of how they raise them and how they get them flush with the pavement, depending upon the cross slope and grade and everything. And, and it's just different every time. All, all we try and do is say, hey, county Caltrans, if you're going to pave city, if you're going to pave. Our team tries to get it designed, and so if if the county city Caltrans goes out to bid on June 1st and opens on July 1st, 
you try and go out to bid like June 15th and open on July 15th so that while they're preparing their bids for the paving, they know we're out there and we go to the pre-con and answer questions and try and you know, inject ourselves into that. And then we open our bids a couple of weeks later. So that whoever was the, the, the low bidder on the paving knows they got the paving and maybe they got a couple of weeks to, to lower their price a little bit and steal the raising. And then it's all a bunch of work they get to do in the same square footage of pavement. So we try and sequence ourselves right into that, that agency bid cycle. And sometimes we're successful, and then sometimes like this, Cal, the CA Rasmussen decided not even to bid. Uh, because Rasmussen is out there doing all of those ADA intersection corners right now, and and they're and they're putting in gutters to a certain level. Right. Well, they're they're. How do they know what that is unless they know it's either know what it's going to be grinding and paving, or they know what the edge is going to be. And, and they know that they're going to put a, uh, when somebody does a two inch overlay, it's not two inches over the whole street. It's, it's two inches in the center and in the drive lanes. And then the, the, the taper is in the last usually six feet or four feet or six feet out from the gutter. And so it goes two inches all the way across the street and then tapers down to, you know, maybe a one or a one and a half inch lip at the edge. And so they know that edge. They don't know what the elevation is going to be out in the street. And even though it's a two inch overlay, it's not really a two inch overlay. I mean, it's as good as the paving machine and the roller can get because they got to, they got to put down the asphalt a little thick because it compresses. So they kind of got a, their rules of thumb, you know, they guess and they put it down a little thick and they roll it to two inches. Well, it might be two and a 16th or it might be one and 15 sixteenths. You know, I mean, they're going to try and get it close. Whether you pay by the square foot or the ton depends upon whether you get two and a 16th or one and nine and 15 sixteenths, you know, there's, there's little things that happen in the paving field. All of that aside, we just try and sequence our stuff, right? So we're, we're interjected into that bid timing. And in, in this case, Rasmussen didn't want to do it. I think Rasmussen didn't want to do it because they make their money on paving and, and blow and go and miles and miles of paving. Some of this manhole raising is tedious, and so you know they, they don't want to they don't want to mess with it. go on to the next job, next freeway, next big job. Entertain a motion. Yeah, I'll I'll make a motion for approval of item sixteen A through. Second. Yeah, motion is second. Second. Director Martinson. Yeah. And Tosh. Uh, yes. Berg. Yes. Yes. And then Chair Stump. Yes. Moving on to item seventeen, consider and approve the engagement of law firm Cassidy Whitmore, OPW, to provide legal counsel to represent to Ohio Valley Sanitary District on human resources and related personal matters. So I'll, I'll start this and I'll turn it over to Robert to answer questions. Um, we have, um, through our CSRMA consortium, we're part of an insurance consortium. We have access to uh, sort of through that as part of our premiums we pay for, uh, we get access to uh, a law firm. It's actually Ebert Cassidy. And we consult them on a number of issues from time to time. How do we do this? What's the best way to do that? And we have access to them through that consortium. And that works for sort of the day in day out sort of things that occasionally that come up. Uh, based on uh, our last board meeting and some, some questions and concerns that uh, were raised uh, as well as from the board um, talking about um, potentially doing a employee survey. I've had some conversations with Robert and I really think it's appropriate that we bring on Lieber Cassidy for consideration to have a much more prominent role rather than in a support role, but more of a lead role on some of those conversations. They can respond to your questions directly. They'll be at the board meetings. They'll be at the committee meetings. They can be front and center on those sorts of things and, and be able to respond accordingly. Um, so with that, that's my recommendation. I'll turn it over to Robert. 
Right. I think the board letter speaks for itself. Uh, the, the background is at your last meeting, I think several considerable issues raised by people of former and current employees. Your board made some pretty pointed comments and concerns addressed. I think that is in the best interest of the agency to get specialized legal counsel for that. Uh, LCW, as, as Jeff has already pointed out, has some familiarity with OPI through the consortium. Uh, they have a very strong bench of attorneys who do this work. And I have had the experience of using and working with LCW in my previous uh, practice as general counsel for an agency about three times the size of this one in the Bay Area. So they know what they're doing. They're very, again, on top of these issues. So the recommendation is just to give direction and authority to your general manager and general counsel to enter into negotiations with LCW to finalize a retainer agreement ensure that the terms and conditions of their employment are well known, as well as some of those particular issues that are, have arisen in the last several months. Well, listen, these are, these are the same folks that are currently doing our ethics and sexual harassment prevention training? No, the sexual harassment and prevention training is actually done through uh, CSDA now in their training portal. They may have previously done it since I've been here. We've just done it online through um, special districts as a training portal now. In special districts they try to rotate amongst different law firms and attorneys to provide that AB one two three four training. So it shouldn't be a problem. In touch. I have some concern about the optics of this. I may be off base, but. Um, at last month's meeting, we had a lot of our staff here, a couple of COP employees speaking, and uh, I'm not sure I fully understand all the issues, but uh, I'm not sure that hiring an attorney or a set of attorneys is really going to be taken well by our employees. I mean, it sounds like we're lawyering up for some kind of a conflict. I, I'm a little nervous about it. We, we had asked for a questionnaire. And I, my personal preference, one out of seven, would be to do the questionnaire and kind of get a better handle on where we are and what our issues are before we hire an attorney. Now, I wouldn't mind waiting until after the questionnaire and hire the attorney, but I'm just afraid of the optics and how it's going to be perceived by our staff. Not qualified to speak on optics in your legal counsel. And so uh, I can tell you that from a legal perspective, and just my understanding of the liabilities involved, as I stated in the letter, this area of the law involving human resources, health benefits, and personnel matters is a consequential area of law, sometimes complex and changing. It is a special counsel that is aware of not only the changes in law, state and federal, but also the implications of litigation and case law as it affects those areas of, of of human resource and personnel law. So it, it is my recommendation, better use, the sooner you have counsel on board to advise and to learn these issues that are particular to this agency, the better off you're gonna be. Now again, it's your decision. You are elected to your seats and optics are an issue of perception. Uh, there's also some reality to that. But I live in a world where my counsel to you is based on the facts and the law. That's why I'm making this recommendation. If you decide that it is going to change the dynamic or the temperature in the room, that's that's your call. I'm giving you my legal opinion and my recommendation that this is in the best interest of the agency to get this counsel at this point in time. Well, no, the director said. In reference to letter, is that in here somewhere? It's item 17, page 232, 266 page I was um, agenda package. 232. 232. Thank you. I didn't see that. Uh, just curious, is Liebert Cassidy centralized in the state somewhere, or do they have a local 
doesn't the state have multiple offices, Sacramento, San Francisco, Fresno, Los Angeles, and San Diego? Our, our, our primary contact, uh, the, the, act, the lawyer who through the consortium actually wrote the current version of the personnel handbook, a uh, guy by the name of Danny Yu, he is out of their LA office. Numerous conversations with him. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that LCW has, like again, many partners. And although there has been a particular contact through the consortium, that whatever we negotiate doesn't limit them to one particular attorney at any given time. They have attorneys who specialize in particular issues of law, and we're hiring a firm, we're not hiring an attorney. Question for Jeff. Um, what would be a typical situation that would cause us to consult with them in the past? Um, I understand there were some changes recently. Well, I think I think there's this constant flow of changes in the law, and and the new case gets gets adjudicated, and we get a a, a flyer or an email blast. Allison and I do, and Robert does. A new case law on such and such a topic. I probably talked to Lieber Cassidy and Allison, and I talked to Lieber Cassidy um, probably more than a dozen times in the past three months. Are those all have something to do with personnel? Yes. Okay. Lieber Cassidy only represents agencies and only does uh, in, in this in this world that we're working on only does uh, HR. And so forth. All other legal agency, public agency HR, specifically public agency. And, and us um, contracting with them would that bring us better representation? Better. Well, I think I think the way I the way I think about it is sort of a support role or a primary. So, if we wanted to talk about um, a certain aspect of the personnel handbook. Uh, and you had a question on it. I would try and do the best I could, but if if we couldn't come to a clear understanding or there was questions, you would ask me. I'd ask them. They'd answer to me. They'd answer back to you. And so it's sort of this this. How does the information flow? How and would that change if they were contracted? If they were if they were contracted. They'd be on that video screen for this board meeting. If we were talking about HR, they'd be on that video screen. If we were talking about something in a personnel committee meeting, and you could ask them directly. Say, why did you why did you write this? Why did you write that? Why did you? I have a question about this. Can you explain that? Where did this come from? Why why not this way? Whatever all those questions are, you would have the ability to have them right there at your fingertips rather than sort of this this longer chain in a support role. I think that's that's necessary where we are. I see that as a as an asset. I would be in favor of course. Um, sort of channeling Director Kentosh's concern uh, is is the goal here to bring Liebert Cassidy on board to act as an HR director no. for the agency? Or, because if it's something different, then it then it could be easy for a skeptical person to say. The board or the agency is hiring Lieber Cassidy to protect the agency from staff complaints. Absolutely not. That's that's no. I, I, so, so what are, what are we hiring here? I, I think it's necessary based on questions to have them sitting on that screen to, to answer your questions. If you have a question, why is this this way? They're right there. Through the consortium, they're not right there. They're a phone call and email away, a phone call and email back, clarification, phone call and email, clarification, phone call and email. And so there's this there's this telephone chain of being able to answer a question. What's the law say? Why does it say that? Is there any le is there any leeway in in um, leeway was certainly a topic at our last meeting. 
if, it, if we were hiring an HR director, and I'm not suggesting that we do because it's a, it's a small agency we're dealing with here, um, an HR director would be at least proposing HR policy be approved by the general manager or the board or whatever as it comes. But it sounds like that's not what that's not what this engagement is for. It's purely to be, answer, be able to answer legal questions. The, the, we, we have two things that staff is working on. One is a um, personnel handbook update. And the second is a class and comp study. Class and comp studies being done. Uh, we had a conference call with them this week. They're moving along, hitting milestones, providing information. <coughs> At the end of that process, there's going to be a document that says, here's the data we got, here's the classifications we've come up with, here's the organizational chart, and we're going to bring that to the personnel committee and say, here's the data and here's a recommendation from staff about where we think uh, we should go and, and why. And then we have a dialogue as, as a committee. If something comes up in that process that, that is a legal question, I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm not qualified to say, here's what current case law is based on all of these factors to say, answer a detailed question you might have. The same goes for a personnel handbook. We, we contracted through the consortium with Lieber Cassidy to write the personnel handbook draft, very draft, basically to say, here are some areas of the law that have changed. Here are some areas where we need to, to do some things. And, and here's basically the facts. It wasn't the recommendation from staff. It was, here's the law. Now let's start talking about where you as a board want to go. Well, the question was, what's the leeway? What's the legal basis for that? Well, I think those should be answered by a lawyer. Whether or not the, the district gives 11 holidays or 12 or, or 13 or 11 plus two floaters, those aren't legal questions. Those are sort of policy questions that would come out of an HR director's sort of role. We're comfortable providing you narratives about HR director level kinds of conversations. But some of the conversations that have been that have been raised over the past short while were legal basis questions. They weren't, should we give 11 holidays or 13 holidays or 11 holidays and two floaters? They were like, is this legal? Is this not what I think this is not legal? Well, those need to be answered by a lawyer. Now I can go get those. but responsiveness and the timing is such that they're not sitting here answering it. So I take those questions and I go send them an email and I get an email back and then I come to report to you. Well, a month's gone by. I would rather, I think, recommend that, that person is right there and be able in real time to answer some of those things. And so we can settle the legal questions and then get down to the policy questions of what's the appropriate HR policy for the district. Where do you have leeway? And what? And then the legal question is, where do you have leeway? And then the the policy question is, what's an appropriate recommendation from staff and a conversation with the board about what leeway you should take or what you would like as a board to implement? So this is this is qualitatively different from the class and comp study, where the contract party is actually coming up with ideas and making recommendations. You're saying Liebert Cassidy would not make recommendations as to HR policy, but simply rule on the legality of whatever ideas come up? Yes, here's the black and white line of okay. this is legal, this is not legal. And if it's legal that you have discretion, then we have a conversation that you could say to me, say, well, give us some ideas on, on some leeway ideas. What is other people doing on that kind of topic? Examples of leeway, yeah, okay. Right. So, so then, so then we know where the legal legal answer is yes, and the legal answer is no, and then we deal with okay. Let's as a as a group ask staff to come up with some recommendations on leeway on a topic, and have a conversation with the board about appropriateness of the leeway. I, I use you know holidays. We're not required to give any holidays. We wouldn't even think about that conversation. But should we have 11, should we have 13? Should we have 11 plus a couple of floaters? Should we have 14? We don't, we don't celebrate 
Cesar Chavez Day. Should we? Should we not? What you know? What should we give this one instead of that one? That whole policy discussion about you know HR sort of policy is a conversation about you know what collectively uh, you as a board want to do and and have a dialogue with us staff. But at least we know where the legal line is. Some of the questions that have been raised have been raised about where is the legal line. Fuzzy is okay. Yeah, I think as a the committee member that sat through some of these things and pondered where we're going or what's what's necessary and what's right, I, I think it's really beneficial to have somebody up here be able to answer those questions. That, that does get frustrating when you have something back to you, also, and then it's three weeks before we get something back on it or the next mm -hmm. meeting and. and at that time, sometimes I'm kind of foggy and don't remember exactly what point it was. So well, there's real value. I certainly support this. So, go ahead. no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. So I'm I'm going to speak to impressions that I had last maybe a long time on the presentations given by at least two employees. My sense of it at the time. All the details in and out is that there was a personality conflict, there was the issue of policy around time off for various needs that employees might have to be away from medical or whatever. So I didn't see anything in there that rose to the level of needing legal representation. How did you phrase it? To represent the district. But clearly, you now feel that there is, and so. My impression is that we're prepping for a lawsuit. I read this, which is his view of optics, I guess. So what what I'm wondering is along what Director Stone said and Director Pussy is it seems to me there are many companies, consultants that do HR work that come in and advise us on these kind of policies not have this and be every bit as, as accurate as an attorney group. So what I'm wondering is why we're not hiring you mentioned the idea of an HR director, but surely there's some HR consultants that come in and do the same thing. I'm to I'm, me that's two different levels of stuff. You said Ordering up versus having a consultant come in and help us with these things. We have not had a consultant here from HR when we talked about this. We did it on our own. And so I certainly value the idea of having, I would consider an expert in that field to help us when these questions come up. I'm just not sure we need to go to the extent of hiring a legal firm to do it. But it really smelled like it when I read this, getting ready for a lawsuit. And I think, in my mind, as you've said, Mr. Cole, these kind of HR issues can lead to lawsuits. So, I'm very concerned that, again, it's my sense, you seem to be thinking we're going to be heading into lawsuits. I didn't see anything in our policy or this discussion from last time that we believe that we've gone that far down that path, but maybe we have. So, personally, I would rather see not an HR director, but an HR firm come in to help us with these things. This is an attorney. Maybe, Mr. Kwan, you can somebody can describe to me the difference why you would have an attorney come in versus an HR consultant. Uh, let me let me answer that question first, and then I was going to make a comment based on some of the things that were being said here. First of all, there are many HR consultant firms that could come in on a pretty much like an ad hoc basis and to assist smaller entities to do the HR work. We've all pointed out this is a small agency, and to hire a full time HR director may not be in the cards or in the finances or maybe even necessary. So that is always a possibility. So I'm just saying that this was a direction that I thought was was, was possible to go in another direction too. I think it fits within the agenda item. 
because you're really looking for HR personnel methods in some of these issues. Uh, I'll say this too, that just having somebody on screen to answer your questions, I want to caution you that, you know, they're there to answer general legal questions. They're not there to answer specific cases involving individual employees and their issues with the agencies, if there are any issues, okay? Again, I don't even know if there are issues. What I heard was that some people were dissatisfied with how things were being done. That could be an issue. It would lead to all sorts of things, one of which is a lawsuit, okay? It could lead to something, nothing more than saying, hey, I just wanted to register my concerns with you, and, and then that, that, that's it. But it could go a lot of different ways. So don't think that this person, whoever it is, whether an HR consultant or an attorney is there to answer every little bitty personnel issue that comes before you and that you want to have answered. Let's say one of the directors says, hey, I spoke to Joe Jones and they told me X, Y, and Z. What do you think, attorney, about what Joe Jones said to me? It's not what they're there for. Right? And there are other issues involved than just getting HR advice. You're a board. You're a board under the Brown Act. There are requirements of how you are to act and how you are to receive information and to put it out for personal information. There's also your bylaws. There's an ethical code of conduct. When you receive information, you deal with it. And then your, your, your bylaws speak to that issue too. So there's multiple legal issues here. HR is just one of them. And so when we talk about how we do what we do here, we're always, I think Jeff, I can speak for Jeff, I speak for myself, we're always trying to give you information to put you in the best position possible to make a good decision, right? The decision's up to you, we're just putting you in a position to do so. As your legal counsel, my primary goal is to ensure that when you act and when you receive information, it is on a legal basis, cannot, that, that, that is defensible, that can be supported if, in fact, you're called on the carpet to it. So that's, that's basically it. And so with that as my general background, there's more than just HR law here. There's how you conduct your business as a board. And you need to be very well aware of that, especially when it comes to personnel items, okay? Because there are privacy rights and there are vested right issues whenever you deal with an employee and, and rights and privileges of their employment compensation. So with all that being said then, I go back to recommendation here is to, to use LCW as that resource. And they are at the they're at the center of this whole issue of public employment. Things are there. The HR consultant, when, when you ask them a difficult question, they're going to say, I know it. No, they're not going to say I know it. I need to consult with my attorney. That's LCW. All right. So you're not getting too much more by bringing in an HR consultant. If you ask a difficult question, it's really going to come down to legal advice. What we're hiring here, it sounds like, is what, what's proposed that we hire here is someone to establish HR guardrails for us, not to propose policy. And I think as a board, First thing that we need to understand, we decide to make changes in HR or anything else, is, is it legal? How much leeway do we have around that? Is it a bright line or a fuzzy line that we can move either side of as, as we decide on HR policy? I don't anticipate we're going to be spending as much time with LCW as we do with Mr. Kwong, for example. I mean, he comes to all the meetings, they come to the meetings, but he does a lot of work outside of the meetings and they might or might not. But I think, I think having someone who is an expert in HR law able to tell us on the spot, where are you with regard to the guardrails of this issue? is a real help to the board. But separate from setting the policy, I don't think that we or anyone else should should look at this firm as as policy makers or policy suggesters. 
Is that correct? Where we're going with this? Okay. Well, I don't disagree with anything you said, but in terms of the number of hours, I notice on the board, I do it myself, is that sometimes we have a lot of questions about particular things. Often it's a hypothetical that we really don't have the answer to. And so the concern is that we're going to have a series of oddball questions that the legal and counsel can advise us on, but in the reality, it's not really something we need to know, establish our policies. So I don't I guess I'm what I'm ultimately going with this. It seems to me if we're gonna do this. We ought to have some sort of an organized schedule how we're going to approach the HR issues as far as meetings to discuss this topic or that topic and you know and build a plan about how we're going to approach this and then decide okay all of those things we need to do when do we really have to have attorneys or HR specialists involved actually help us at those hard rails as you say right now it's kind of loosey goosey we talk about stuff we bring up this case we bring up that issue and somebody comes and gives us a talk about something i don't have any clue what they're really talking about we can't do anything with it. and it just seems to me that we need to get into this a bit more and try to figure out what it is we're really trying to do and specifically what kind of questions do we really have that we can answer to once we get put together, then we could go out and or whatever kind of consult we think we need to do. But to me, this seems immature for where we are in that HR process. It may be late in terms of who really think we're going to lawsuits. I still can't tell where we really are, but it, uh, so I, I don't have a strong objection to it. I just think <coughs> more developed reason as to why we think we need them over what time period we think we might need them or for you know how many meetings or whatever but to me that's also not an issue to resolve tonight because that that could be a four-hour discussion in itself you know but perhaps the personnel committee initially or anyway i <laughs> i would just like to add that uh, your comments about wanting to know exactly why we are needing advice, what are the questions that are being asked. I think that whenever you're dealing with HR issues, you're dealing with personal issues. There's personal issues, there's privacy issues, and there's confidentiality issues. Those things need to be respected, which is why I think having an attorney earlier rather than later is more helpful. Because to have that discussion, what it is that these issues are, we're going to get into personality issues and we're going to get into individual personnel cases. And I wanted to have the best counsel ready at that time to deal with it rather than have what I would consider to be a potentially um, libelous, not not libelous, it would even increase the risk of liability to have those conversations about individual cases without having an attorney there to say, I think we're getting a little far afield here. I mean, and to, 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 to as using the guardrails aspect uh, to do that, you know, uh, to have that available to you. So I, I, I fully agree with you. You want to know what it is you're dealing with. You want to get the universe of issues before you figure out who to bring in. Very similar to the sledge issue. You know, we have a sledge issue. We need a sledge contractor. We don't need any contractor. We need a special sledge contractor. I understand that, but these issues are so multifaceted because they deal with personal issues and privacy issues and are subject to confidentiality under a numerous laws in California. Because again, remember, you're in the state of California, the most progressive state in regards to human resource and personnel law in the entire United States. So you need someone who knows these issues and how they affect these different areas of law. That's why. Well, I, I certainly am interested in that, and I appreciate you reminding me. But at the same time, at the last meeting, we were talking about having people come in individually, talk to us, you know, and, and 
the time we were, oh yeah, let's do that. But now we're saying, oh, we better not do that unless we have an attorney there. So, you know, again, I'm kind of, I don't expect in these meetings that we would have to talk about the HR policy. I'm, for me, that's, here's the document we went through a while ago that's, that we had questions about. At that time, when we were going through that, a lot of questions came up. We didn't have benefit of these talks that we were getting, you know, received. And so I didn't see anything in that that really needed an attorney. Now we've got two people that came up and gave us some pretty pointed comments. And now all of a sudden I see we think we need an attorney. So to me, it's kind of two different issues. There's those people that are not satisfied with how things went. And there's the general policy of the HR policies of the district. As far as the general policies of the HR dis the district, I don't see the need for having attorneys there, to be honest. But again, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not privy to all the many discussions that Jeff has said he's had with them over the last couple of months. So I don't know really what's going on, but I'll leave it to the sense of the board as to what you want to do with this. Personally, I would wait until we have a better idea, specific issues around the HR policy alone, not the issues that were raised by the individuals. individuals. Once we have that, if we feel that we really need some level of expertise to help us answer those, whether that's an HR consultant, you know, or a legal firm, you know, I never I think that would be fine. Anyway, I that's what I said, so I'll just be quiet now. <laughs> okay, do we need a motion on this in the vote? I would I would move approval of item 17 direction to staff that it is our intent to to scale the involvement of Uber Cassidy to our understanding of the personnel issues within the district. So that is they're not they're not going to be able to do anything at the outset of an engagement, except tell us if we've done something or proposed to do something illegal. But they can later perhaps give us more refined and more extensive advice. So when you say personnel issues, excluding the two that we talked about, right? That time, just the general uh, well, I think I think the things that we heard about the last meeting led to a lot of questions here. Those would involve ultimately staff and the board recommending HR policies, and that's when we need to know if something is legal or not legal. See, that's that's where I get is what I heard. Two people, if they thought the policy said this about needed time off, and instead they got this, mm -hmm. and that's a specific policy. Adjudicates that question. That's a specific policy question. Well, you know, it, what it, I would it, want be a policy to, that's involved in the law. The question is, you know, sometimes you can have policies within a district or a company, whatever, that either policy might be applicable to the particular situation. And there's probably some leeway for an HR rep or a supervisor, a manager, or CEO, whatever, to say, well, those options, I'm going to go this way. The employee feels, no, you should have gone this way. And so there's unhappiness created. But I think what Juan is saying is we're going to get into the issues of those two cases. Now we're running into privacy issues and all that. And I don't see how we can evaluate those two cases without having those people come in and tell us specifically what the problem is. To know whether the law or the policy was applied appropriately or not. And I think it's I think it's a legal question whether a policy was 
applied properly or not. We have to know the particulars of the case, which gets into the policy issues. We can't just say well, it was applied, but without knowing what it was applied to. We have to know the particulars of that. And the last time, those people seemed willing to come in and talk to us about those and that's Mr. Plumley said, and that's a privacy issue. And we're not sure as a board we can even hear that stuff. And so if we can't hear those kind of particulars, then I'm we heard it. Why do you need an attorney? Yeah. <laughs> we heard it in public comment at the last meeting. No, we didn't hear the specifics of what it is they were not all the specifics. We would know the specifics. There were definitely questions of application of the policy. law. You know which policy it was they were asking about? Don't. Know which one was chosen to apply to them or not. One seemed to be very unhappy about how it was applied. It shouldn't have been the way it was applied. That they thought it should be something else. So how do we sort that out? Well, that's what I'm saying. Because you know, if my feeling is, you know, those people were willing to come in and talk to us. They said that at the time, and we were all in favor. Yeah, let's have a meeting and do that. And now we're getting advice that we probably really shouldn't do that because of privacy issues. My sense of this is without knowing the details of what exactly it was they were upset about well, i don't know how we can look at our hr policy and say that it's appropriate in the first place and it was applied properly in the second place without knowing the details i do think that having an hr rep or legal representation talking about the general hr policy Here's our policy and going through our policy without talking about anything in specific. We could do that very well with an attorney, or we could do it with an HR and then probably solve 95% of the problems with them. But if we're going to get into the specific personnel issues that were raised at the last meeting, I think we've been advised that we probably shouldn't do that for reasons of privacy, and perhaps implications with the Brown Act. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I hear all the concerns here. They're not founded or uh, inconsequential, but I think Dr. Pelosi has used a very good term where you deal with attorneys or with anyone who's going to give you advice. You scale it properly. I think that that is why the commission requested in this, in this uh, recommendation is to direct staff and legal counsel to draft and execute a letter of legal services agreement. We're not specific as to what it is. We are seeking your direction to scale it properly. And that I've looked at a lot of retainer agreements in my lifetime, but there are different levels of, of that representation. And then we can just scale it. We want you to do this primarily. And then when it comes to this issue, they'll come back to you. Remember, you're the client. You decide what issues are property before you and your attorneys will help you decide what those things are too. So at the, at the, at the very get go, um, the, the general manager said, you have the personnel policy within it, which are a myriad of issues. Okay. You say that uh, the employee manual, there's a lot of different things going on there as well as a, as the class of comp study. So that at the very beginning, you need the legal advice to that. If it gets down to an individual issue, and even if it comes before you, either through the your, your administrative grievance procedures or whatnot, you'll have a, a plenty of, of, of lead time to know what that is and whether or not counsel is going to be engaged for that purpose. So I go back to the point again. This can be scaled. It doesn't have to be complex. You don't have to know everything before you enter into this agreement. A lot of these agreements are done. The anticipation or the potentiality of issues being raised. Will they be raised? Maybe. Will they not be raised? Maybe that's happening too. Maybe these people go away. Maybe they say, hey, I've had enough. I've said, I've said my piece and I'm going to go away. So you always hire professionals and advisors on the potential for an issue. Not because there is an issue, but there's a potential for one. So again, I think this is well within scaling aspect of it. I think your concerns should not override your need for particular counsel that will, as, as every board should do, the fiduciary duty of, of this agency and to protect this agency. And the best way to do that is to hire legal counsel 
specializes in public employment law. I have a motion to get, does that change your motion at all or is it the same motion? Same motion. Can you ask for a typical retainer fee? Because at some point we're going to do something that triggers billable hours. Right. So if we, if we initiate a retainer, let's just say that for whatever reason, we really don't need them for six months. What have we paid for the next six months? Well, there's, there's many ways that legal services agreements are done. Either there is a retainer or there's a set amount paid up front, and then the hourly rates are then gone down from that amount. Um, a lot of these public agency law firms, some of them, depending on the work, will do on a retainer basis or they'll go straight hourly right from the beginning. The very moment you ask them, they're just going to charge you an hourly and not ask for an upfront cost. We don't know the exact structure of their retainer agreement. I can tell you that it most likely will be a straight hourly based on partner and the different levels of experience of the people involved. So, how many hours would we need? Assuming that we don't have a real question for them for and that's scaling. I mean, hey, for the first month, you may not even have any uh, need for for legal counsel. Well, I would say, as a minimum, we're going to have them attending these board meetings. Three board meetings. Mm -hmm. They have said all the committee meetings too. Well, I think personnel committee at least. It's an HR. If there's a topic on a committee meeting, or there's a topic at a board meeting that is HR related. Where they're well, I can see that, yeah. And and if it's at a board meeting, we'll schedule it as the first topic so that they come to the meetings, we answer deal with that issue first, then they're off the clock, and then we talk about pumps and motors and wires and stuff that, that is more appropriate. And there's a way to scale this to say here's an expert that has particular subject matter expertise that can answer questions, and we're gonna put it in an appropriately scheduled sort of sequence so that we get the the resource there if we want the questions, and then when we're doing our regular business, they're not just sitting there billing us for the time to come to a board meeting. I mean, so we schedule it accordingly. Well, here's here's what I would. What you're saying is directly what I do, assuming we have them. But I've also seen now when we have these HR discussions at these meetings, they get quite extended. And so, what I'm thinking is it would be better if we could structure some committee, maybe even create a new committee where we just focus on HR so that we actually have the time to go through all the questions and deal with all the this and that's that come up with those HR discussions so that, so that it's not well, we take an hour and a half with HR at the beginning of the board meeting and then we've got the rest of it to do too. You can see what I'm saying. Sure. My, my concern on on just where we are today on, on this whole HR discussion is the the there are policy conversations and there are some legal conversations and they're intertwined. And if we were only talking about very simply policy discussions, I, I think by and large what I see on the class and comp study is policy. I don't see a lot of legal questions coming out of class and comp study, just based on what I see board chart, job descriptions, comparative salary analysis, comparative benefit analysis. I, I don't see legal things coming out of that. But that's a policy discussion. But on the, on the employee handbook and some of the implementation of some of those complex things, the, 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 the line is fuzzy between the policy and the legal. I think it would be appropriate for when we're having conversations about the, the personnel handbook, probably to have some subject matter expertise available to say, that's policy, that's legal, let's talk about legal, here's the black and white line, then we can decide, okay, now we're gonna go back to the policy, knowing what we know over here on the legal side. The comp study, I, I wouldn't have them show up at the first class in comp study discussion, because I don't think, based on what I see, I don't think there'll be questions. As we walk through it on the policy discussion, if we get to a point and we say, hey, here's a question, then we can figure out a forum to, to answer that question with the subject matter expert. This is not a lawyer show up at our board meeting and sit here through the whole thing and watch the audit and watch us talking about pumps and motors and everything else. This is come have the conversation about what we need to have them there for. 
where it's appropriate to have, have the experts there for the subject their expertise is on. With all that, I'm just wondering if it would be better to have a specific meeting to talk about HR and not do it as a general board meeting. And that may, meeting that, that may be a special meeting and we may get to the point to do that. I, I think some of it is clear policy and some of it, to me, is intertwined. And, and, well, I don't, and so I, I don't want to go into those conversations and, and have pseudo policy, pseudo uh, legal discussions and, and have to dance around and not answer questions because we don't have the subject matter experts in the room to answer the questions that come up. I'm agreeing with the idea of having a subject matter person there. And we may get to the point. We had a focused meeting that maybe there's even a prior meeting where we go through stuff. We have six questions pop up. We have another meeting where these experts are invited. We can answer the six things that they need or, you know, I, I, I just want the meeting focused so we can get that stuff resolved rather than dragging out in the way I've seen it gone in the last several meetings. So. I, I'm 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 all for doing I mean special meetings or study sessions or focus groups to, to answer questions that that have come up and that you may have. And let's have the right people in the room to do that. I'm on board with that. Director Berg. Yes, I'll second Director Quillis's motion. Okay. I think we have a motion and a second. Third motion discussion. Be seconded. Good. I have a motion from Quillisy and Director Berg the second. Yeah. Martinson. Yeah. Director Kendosh. No. Oh. Director Berg. Yes. Director Quillacy. Yes. And Chair Stone. Yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Is Director Cole, what's his name? How do I run up from over there? Do clerk uh DRSD and uh, went through uh uh, three, three votes before I went uh, <laughs> up liver here. <laughs> so that uh, I vote yes. The other <laughs> bill. <laughs> I've always noticed that we have three bills. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's always been two. All right. So we've gone to that one. An average cost per hour for things like that. Uh, the range is anywhere between three fifty and four fifty an hour. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to information items. Anybody like to pull anything off at 18, 19, 20, 21? I just want to say I enjoyed the photograph where I had to do a double take of the very small truck. <laughs> <laughs> For very small backup jobs. Anything else on there from anybody? Board member comments. General manager comments. Um, a couple of things. We're tracking some rain. Um, the first storm is sort of upon us and is I'm sure is registering any from the rain gauge. So we just went and get to driving. Um, they say the storm uh, Tuesday night through or Wednesday through Friday. Um, over those three days, they're talking about three inches or so. So some rain. Um, we're not tracking it from a, a, be a problem sort of rain for us, but definitely something to watch. We have a number of situations at our lift stations that we're we're, we're tracking. So um, we've had some um, um, some pumps at Rancho Matillaha that have had some troubles. Just pumps getting old. Uh, we have uh, some new sensors, some Vega sensors. That are being installed as we speak um, to give us better level control and, and understanding what's going on. So the guys have a heightened alert of things, but I don't think it's a problem. Um, as we talked about a little bit last time, Dairy Farmers of America has ceased operation out at the Pepsi plant. The uh, the Pepsi the Pepsi plant is owned by Pepsi, but DFA is uh, they made those little uh, Starbucks jars of, of mocha and latte. Um, and uh, they dumped a lot of uh, milk and whey products to us. And so their bill was excessive over the years because not only did they pay for their capacity units, they paid a surcharge because of the 
the additional loading on the so that's gone away. Past units are still owned by pest. Um, and uh, but the DFA overages uh, will cease to come our way. Now we haven't budgeted the DFA overages over the years because we just didn't believe that it was an appropriate thing to depend on. And sure enough, um, it's it's gone away. Um, we fully expect the Pepsi plant to be uh, used for some other use. It's too uh, attractive of a site. It's got um, floor space. It's got trucking access. It's got water rights. It's got sewer rights. If I was to guess, take a wild guess, I'd say it becomes a brewery. Um, people are looking for places where they have access to those sorts of facilities. So uh, we'll lose a bit, we'll lose some income from the overages, but we've never counted on that income in our operating budget. It's sort of been extra over the years. So uh, we'll just have to sort of be a little bit more cognizant of that going forward. Um, the city recently approved the Cabrillo Economic Development Corp, uh, 49 units on the vacant flag lot parcel behind the Humane Society over there off of Bryant. 50. Um, nine plus a manager. Uh, I saw the 49. Um, so that, that will come to us in terms of capacity charges. I understand that part of their actual build is dependent upon state funds, which given the deficit uh, in the state funds, I'm not sure what the likelihood of that coming to us quickly is. Um, but it is another 50 units that sort of we've been tracking and is, is getting closer to uh, fruition. Again, I mentioned last time there's still some ongoing work. There's a uh, six or eight uh, septic property owners on the, in the location of uh, Foothill and Foothill Lane that are pursuing a uh, connection to sewer. They're already annexed, so they don't have to go through the annexation process, um, but they've made some other inquiries of us. So I think there's some chance that they'll be going forward. The last thing is the last next couple of days, I'll be out of the office. I'll be available by phone. I got elected by the family. Fly to Chicago tomorrow and um, meet my daughter for uh, dinner and then drive her car back. She's, uh, she's moving from Chicago to uh, Hanford to meet her uh, fighter pilot fiance. So I got elected by the family to drive the car. So if you need me by phone, feel free. It's, it's for a good cause. <laughs> so uh, I'll be on the I'll be on the forty freeway somewhere for the next couple of days. But, uh, Han uh, Hanford in oh, by Fresno. One more. Oh, he's a you're, Hanford, Washington. Also, yeah, he's a your town. <laughs> F-18 fighter pilot, and uh, he's stationed in war, and so she's um, flying out with her kitties tomorrow or driving the car. Feel free to call. I'll Good luck. Plenty, plenty. <laughs> it's about $1,000 to have an auto carrier pick the car. Yeah, yeah but she, she didn't want, she has, um, she's a big horse rider and has her, her, her prized saddle in the car and a bunch of other stuff she doesn't want to. A horse trailer attached to the car. No, it's the saddle. <laughs> anyway, if you want to call, I have plenty of time to. <laughs> also, just as an aside, ours group has 15 people. Two of them got COVID last week, which went to the Christmas party. So just where it's still out there. Where were they? <laughs> what city was that? Uh, LA. Bingo City, particularly. But... Still out there. Question. Just in dollarage, what's the uh, mm. reduction? Brief um, So uh, their straight bill um, is about thirty thousand a month. So that that income will still be there or close to that. Um, so three hundred fifty, three hundred sixty thousand is their annual. Their average. Uh, has been anywhere from a hundred to four hundred thousand a year. A lot of crap machine. <laughs> when, when DFA came in, did Pepsi stop making Pepsi there? Um, well, Pepsi kind of Pepsi now is just using that facility as a uh, transfer station, a logistic, logistics distribution point. But the, the four hundred and fifty capacity units they own. 
are pre-1985. And so I think they're only worth $800 a piece if they tried to sell them back. You don't get to buy them at 800, keep them for 20 years and sell them at 16,000. You get a refund based on the purchase price at the time. Anybody uh, prior to 85 who had grandfather in is $800. So they'd be crazy to sell them back. So they have a facility where they have industrial floor roof structure. They already have the trucking access and are entitled for so many truck trips a day. They already have entitlements for so much water usage a day They because they're using a lot of water. Um, and then they have the, the entitlement for the sewage uh, treatment to us and uh, industrial permit. So it's a pretty attractive site. I, I, I will be shocked if, if in some period of time it's not reused, if not in a month or two, but I would be shocked if it's not a brewery or something. Um, if they maintain the 450 capacity unit, and that's 450 times $58 or so right. every month that will go on. Yes. It's just the overage, but every year we we haven't budgeted it. And with the overage, we've always just put it in the contingency reserve. So that's paid for, you know, some projects here and there that's paid for in rates a little lower, you know, um, over year over the years. News on the gaslight project in Miramati or the farm worker housing over here on the Avenue. Um, we've been getting quite a bit of. We hear a lot of it politically about the farm worker housing down on the avenue. I haven't seen anything from the county in terms of uh, planning. Uh, I think they're going through the internal reviews. Uh, the you gaslight. Cut all the trees and put in ground cover. Long time. Uh, I, you know, I, the interesting thing about the uh, the farm worker housing is is when the state said you didn't have to have affordable housing, you had certain exemptions from CEQA in terms of review. That project sort of checks all those boxes. Right or wrong politically or you know, neighborly or whatever. It, it, um, it, it, whether or not that goes through is probably a political question, not a technical. I, I don't think that one stops for a technical reason. I think it stops it's politics. The gaslight, they had some soils problems that the gaslight is in an, uh, down in the weeds, a Alquist Priolo zone, which is a zone of potential faults. They did some fault trenching. They're doing some analysis. I, I think a lot of these affordable housing projects are, are going to happen in some way, shape or form because the, the the CEQA coverage is has been eliminated by the state. Traffic, water, sewer stuff. You can't stop it for a technical reason or it's severely limited in your ability to sort of say no. I mean, it's not the wrong project in the wrong location, but that's sort of a different question. One, one last question. The topic that came up in the last board meeting was an employee satisfaction survey. Are we deciding to do something or are we not deciding to do something? If we are, what are we doing? Well, it was, it was my thought based on the direction I heard is you wanted to do it. And then uh, what would the questions be and that? Would be an appropriate topic for a personnel committee or appropriate committee. Probably be appropriate to have subject matter experts there in terms of what questions to ask and what not to ask. I think we will be on that soon. That's all I have. So you have that's it. Yeah, I just say that I miss the late night coffee brewing smell. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do your walk around in the evening. Yeah. Haven't had it in a while. All right. Thanks, everybody. And with that,
We will adjourn at 8.04. Okay.